Good evening, and thank you for being here to listen to me about Nicaragua. How many of you know a little bit about Nicaragua or ever heard the name Nicaragua before? So, as you heard before, I was born in Nicaragua and I left Nicaragua when I was 17 to study political science with a scholarship from the French government. When I left Nicaragua in the mid-60s, I left because I wanted to study political science uh, because I wanted to do something about the situation in Nicaragua. At the time, um, I remember very clearly when there was a, a there, were, there was a, a massacre of students and in one of the demonstrations that I participated as a student, even though I was in a Catholic uh, school, um, we hid in a church and my father had to come and get me out. But in, um, my divorce coincided with the fall of Somoza. And uh, when Nicaragua had a, 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 a popular uprising, the people finally said no, uh, they wanted to get rid of the dynasty of the Somoza family, who reigned in the country for 43 years. The Sandinistas won the revolution, and it was a very, uh, it was a, I never forget when I went back to Nicaragua, it was a very exciting moment, because it, it, it gave hope, not just to the people of Nicaragua, but to the people of Latin America and throughout the world who believe that a revolution could really make a change and bring democracy and justice to Nicaragua. And at first it looked like it was going to be like that. But of course the United States at the time was not happy that Nicaragua had a government that didn't want to uh, allow American companies to uh, ransack the country. To make this story a bit shorter for you to be able to understand is that in 1990, Daniel Ortega had an, Nicaragua had an election and Daniel Ortega lost the election. The majority of the people in Nicaragua couldn't believe that he was going to lose the election because, um, because uh, he was popular and because the opponent to him was a woman called uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Chamorro, who was the, the widow of a very famous um, Nicaraguan hero who was called Pedro Joaquin Chamorro, who had been assassinated and who in fact um, <coughs> triggered the fall of Somoza. Um, Violeta Barrios de Chamorro became president of Nicaragua. It was completely unpredicted. Everyone who was in Nicaragua thought that she was never going to win that election, but she did. And one of the reasons why she won the election is because of the obligatory military service and because the, um, this, the economic situation in Nicaragua, because of the embargo from the United States, was make, were making the life of Nicaraguan people very difficult. So, as you saw in that film, it took Daniel Ortega 16 years to come back to power. While he was in power, before he lost his election, he went after the private sector and, uh, and he tried to make some reforms, and, but they invested so much in military equipment to fight the Contra War because the Contra War took place sometimes during the 80s. I myself was um, an opponent of the Contra War and I was spending a lot of time in the US and I opposed uh, President Reagan's Contra War because I felt that it was not the way to solve the problem in Nicaragua by having an, an intervention, an American intervention, a foreign intervention, intervention in, the, in the country. So when Daniel Ortega came back to power, it was an extraordinary accomplishment, the way he ran that election. The Cardinal, Cardinal Obando y Bravo, was the biggest Contra leader in the country. And he was the man who the people uh, listened to. Uh, he 
he was the man that the media focused on as the most prestigious contra person in Nicaragua. But Daniel Ortega became very perverse, very cunning. And what he did is that he found out, apparently, that the cardinal had a son and that the cardinal had been involved in some corruption. Somehow, the cardinal campaigned with Daniel Ortega. And suddenly, Daniel Ortega was not the revolutionary leader that we have known, but began to speak like a, like a religious preacher and to talk about forgiveness and to talk about dialogue and to talk about all the right words to convince those who didn't believe in him. And he won the election, but what he did is very important. When he came to power, he was going to do exactly everything that he had not done, and he was going to prevent the private sector and the richest family to go against him. So he made pacts with the most corrupt people in the country, he made pacts with the oligarchy, he made pacts with the richest people in Nicaragua, he went after other political parties, he bought them, and he began to dismantle all the institution and to take over, as you listen in that film, to take over the judicial, uh, to take over parliament, and to take over every institution of the country. And when we had the next election, what he did in 2016, because the first thing he did as well was to change the constitution so Daniel Ortega can run for president for life in Nicaragua. Um, what, when this, the election for 2016 were approaching, what he did was that there was uh, a, a political party that was a coalition of different, uh, different political parties of Nicaragua is that he made sure that they became uh, illegal and they were not allowed to participate as well he got because everybody will do anything you know all the institution will do what he asked um, uh, he made uh, he expelled 20 members of parliament and and from then on Daniel Ortega uh, began from the moment that he was elected he began to buy uh, the networks in Nicaragua so at the end Today, you find that he owns about 11 television network. He owns almost all the newspaper, with the exception of La Prensa, which was the newspaper that Mrs. Chamorro, husband, was the editor and is the voice, really, of the Nicaraguan. There was another newspaper called El Nuevo Diario, and for many years, uh, it wouldn't say uh, it wouldn't really uh, had the the courage to tell the Nicaraguans what was ha the, the, the truth about what Daniel Ortega was doing, and there is a remarkable and I I urge you to go and listen to him. His name a remarkable journalist in Nicaragua. His name is Carlos Fernando Chamorro. He is the son of Pedro Joaquin Chamorro, the great um, journalist who was assassinated by Somoza. At first, Carlos Fernando ran the Sandinista paper that was called Barricada. But then very soon, Carlos Fernando became disenchanted with the Sandinistas. I would say not with the Sandinistas because that's the mistake that we all make. Because the important thing to realize is that Daniel Ortega is not the Sandinistas. Daniel Ortega is an Orteguista. And there is a lot of the Sandinista leaders who have um, disavowed him, who have distanced himself from him. And one of the first who distanced himself from him was um, Ernesto Cardenal. <coughs> I don't know if any of you remember, or is old enough to remember when the Pope went to Nicaragua and there was a priest who was the Minister of Culture that the Pope was telling him off for being in a political party. Well, Ernesto Cardinal was one of the first people who denounced Daniel Ortega and the reason he denounced him is because Daniel Ortega is being accused by his stepdaughter to have sexually assaulted and to have been a pedophile. But the thing which makes me so indignant, so outraged, and that makes me so angry, is that many in Nicaragua don't talk about that. We all know that he did seduce 
his stepdaughter from the age of 13. And she's not the only one that he seduced, the other young girls, other little girls that he has seduced. And if you follow me on Twitter, Abianka Jagger, today I put a Twitter because today what is happening in Nicaragua is we had the, the, uh, the demonstrations, we had the students who have, um, who have gathered together and who are the ones that are leading uh, this, uh, this civic uprising against Daniel Ortega and his wife, who, by the way, is the vice president. That was the payoff to her because she stood by him again, her own daughter. So she's called um, Rosario Murillo. And in fact, if you look and you read about Nicaragua, you will find that in many ways, Rosario Murillo is the person that is leading the country. How did this big movement begin? It all began because sometime in March, there was a fire. Nicaragua has beautiful um, uh, reserves and has a beautiful untouched nature in many ways, perhaps because of the war. And there was a reserve called Indio Maiz, and there was a fire in, and the government of Daniel Ortega did nothing to try to stop it. The Costa Rica government offered to send uh, their fire, the, 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 the firemen who are expert on, 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 on putting out fires in, in the jungles, but Daniel Ortega turned it down and allowed it to be destroyed. Later on, people found out that the reason why he allowed it is because they were going to have roads go through, private business that needed to have the, the, the great uh, ecological reserve destroyed so that they could put roads in this place. And that was really what it started, the demonstration of the students. And then there was the issue of the national security and, uh, and that was going to reduce the pensions of people, was going to increase the quota of the people, and then finally the people began to wake up in Nicaragua. But I, I take a step back. I don't know if you're aware that Daniel Ortega has a, uh, the large, has a project for the largest canal in the world. And this canal will be what I call, and I have written about it, an environmental crime, because Nicaragua has a lake a beautiful lake, which is the number eighth in the world and is the largest source of water for Central America. But he wants to cut that lake to create this insane um, canal. Uh, we don't need a canal. That is the Panama Canal. Uh, and then the people who opposed and the people who stood up and the people who, who marched and the people who spoke against it were the, the poor farmers the campesinos, and I last year, and you can find that even in that article on the Mail on Sunday, to my great surprise, the Mail on Sunday posted the, uh, my video where I go and I give speeches together in the march with the, with, the, with the poor farmers. But of course, the poor farmers were not attractive enough for the people in the cities of Managua. It was very remote, it was far away, and of course the media is not you have very few media which is independent. And, and so it was the reason why I went to be with them, because I knew that if I went, they will be forced to speak about it. And when I went there, I confronted Daniel Ortega, and I said to him, uh, I did interviews in which I, I spoke almost as he was speaking to him personally and directly, and, and said, aren't you ashamed to be following on the footstep of the dictator Somoza? You have become a Somoza, and you are selling all natural resources to foreign companies because he intended, or he intends to do this canal with a, with, a, with, a, with a very mysterious Chinese company. We don't know if the Chinese government is behind. But all I can say to you is that when the students began their movement and the demonstration. The farmers came from very far away to support them. And one of the most moving things I read was from a student that put a tweet that says how grateful and how ashamed they were that when the, when the poor farmers uh, were fighting their battle against Daniel Ortega, we didn't go to them, but they had come to us. And so suddenly, 
there is a, a, a people are united in their idea. They suddenly they realize that Daniel Ortega is a is a blood is a bloody and a brutal dictator, or that then that Ortega and Murillo are a brutal dictator. But the one thing that is important to understand, they don't have weapons. So you have in the one hand the students who have stones and who have um, who have uh, fireworks and that who have um, improvised uh, weapons that they made from from fireworks, and then you have in the other hand the the police and the anti riot police, and you have the paramilitary or la juventud sandinista on the other hand, who are shooting live ammunition, who are killing the students, and so far. We have, because every day it changes, we have 53 students who have been murdered. But that's not all. One of the worst things that is happening is that many of the hospital will not treat. As I was coming here and I was putting tweets about it, I read how in Leon, which is the city where my father was born and my mother were born, are not, uh, forgive me, not Leon, Masaya, um, which is a revolutionary city, is not um, treating the wounded students. But there were not only those students who were killed, there were students who were tortured, there were students who have their eyes gouged out. Uh, and there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people who are wounded. And then it's, a dialogue is being called by the church. It is a different church. Uh, it is no longer Cardinal Urban de Bravo. We have a different cardinal. He's called um, Cardinal Brennis. And we have an extraordinary, uh, an, a, a courageous, a brave priest that is called Silvio Baez, who has been speaking and who has been supporting the, the, the students. But the church has asked to have a dialogue with Daniel Ortega. And they had four points. Among those, uh, one of those points was that they wanted to have the the, in Spanish is called CID, which is uh, the International Commission for Human Rights of the OAS, or the American State Organization for, for, for all of the Americas. And Daniel Ortega said that he was going to allow it. And he's finally said yes, but he had not agreed to the other three points. And one of those points should be to put an end to the aggression, to put an end to the killings, and, and to allow freedom of expression. And the, and the, and the bishop uh, have had four points, but today the bishop had given in, and they will, have, will sit down with Daniel Ortega with only one point fulfilled by him, which is to allow the International Commission for Human Rights to come to Nicaragua. And I put a Twitter today in which I ask this remarkable and this uh, uh, revere priest, bishop, I said, Monse Monsignor, I say, do you think it is moral to sit down with a man who is a pedophile? And I put another one, and I, he, he responded to me, and he said that, that it, it was necessary to do anything to achieve peace. But as you, many of you know, perhaps you're old enough to realize that dictators, they always call for dialogue, is what you had in Venezuela. It's something I have learned. They only gaining time, so that the fever, the the fervor, the the desire of the students to bring a democracy and justice to Nicaragua fades away. That the people get tired and bored, and that the economic situation get worse. And I fear that that is what happened, and that is what will happen in Nicaragua. And I do hope that the students will not give in that the people in Nicaragua will not wiggle in. I was supposed to have here a communication on Skype with a student of Nicaragua. They are waiting to speak to you, but we've not been allowed to have this link with the Nicaraguan student. So for any of you, if you would want to, maybe I can do it in somewhere else, but all I'm asking you is please write a letter of support to the students of Nicaragua. It is critical. They need our support. The media in this country has hardly covered 
what is happening in Nicaragua. More are going to be killed every day. There is another one who's been killed, another person who's been killed, another person, another civilian who was an arm who's been killed. And I feel powerless and all I can do is to stay up and to write tweets and to use my social media to communicate with the Nicaraguans who are communicating with me and to try to get the, pre the public in, Amer in, the in, in the United Kingdom and in the rest of the world to realize that Nicaraguans exist and that we need your help. Thank you very much. That was the reason why I didn't want to have question asked because I thought I wanted to tell you this story from my perspective. Thank you so much, Ms. Jagger, for such a moving address. I think now we'll open straight out to questions from the audience. Um, so yeah, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and then wait for a microphone to be sent to you. Yeah, great. You just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Yeah. Um, you mentioned La Prensa, so the only like non-government controlled newspaper yeah. basically how do people have access to it and if it's is it even an effective means of communication to the people is it accessible to people well or? of course it is small and and now other newspapers like el nuevo diario are beginning to speak up more freely mm. and there is carlos fernando but what is happening in nicaragua is that social media is really the means for people to, to, to inform each other. I mean, I had, you know, I had some Nicaraguans follow me, but suddenly in the last few days, and perhaps it is because I am retweeting everything they're putting, that is how they get the news. So you know everything that is happening, where there is an uprising, where, uh, where is the police, you know, where is the, where is the police and the anti-riots arriving, how many people have been killed, all of that you're learning. There are some very good human rights organizations. There is one called CENID. Um, but the main source of media is Carlos Fernando Chamorro, La Prensa, and people on social media, on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I was just wondering, what do you think about the international media? Are they covering the truth from Nicaragua enough, or is it very poor covered for internationally wise? Well, the British media has hardly covered. I was quite grateful that the Mail on Sunday, who is the least suspected newspaper, wrote this big article about me coming to speak here and really allow me to say and quite accurately put everything that I, I said in the interview. Um, the BBC had, uh, BBC Radio um, uh, had someone in Nicaragua and, uh, and they've been now and then covering. I will be doing an interview this evening and tomorrow. But really, there is not much being said here. And uh, in America, there's a lot more. The New York Times has reported, the Washington Post has reported. But in general, NPR, there is a radio in the United States. In general, no, the media is not interested. I think we need to have more people kill for them to really care. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks again for the talk. I was just wondering what your thoughts were about how Nicaragua rebuilds when or if ever the situation there kind of heals itself. And um, what's it going to take for the students to regain faith in the current regime? Or does it actually take regime change for there to be any um, meaningful um, end to the conflict? So let me, a very good question. You allow me to tell you a bit more about. The problem and the big dilemma you have today in Nicaragua is that in the one hand, Daniel Ortega was able to dismantle the opposition party. So there is no leader. The students, this is a popular insurrection without any leader. The only leader today in Nicaragua that has any credibility is, or, or the only leaders, is Francisca Ramirez, which is this extraordinary uh, campesina, this <coughs> farmer uh, who was fighting against the canal with who I march, this remarkable, uh, articulate and, and powerful woman. Uh, she has become a leader in Nicaragua. 
You have Carlos Fernando Chamorro, the son of uh, Violeta and Pedro Joaquin, who has become extremely, who is highly respected in Nicaragua because of his, his, uh, his excellent journalism. But he has, little by little, he's become more and more political and more outspoken. He always tried to be very um, uh, impartial, but I think that he's begun to speak. The other leader in Nicaragua today is Bishop um, Silvio Baez, which is the other person that I told you. But really, there are no political leaders in Nicaragua. So that you have in the one hand. Then you have Daniel Ortega, which I don't believe has any intention of leaving Nicaragua, even though the people want him to go. And then uh, what is the future for Nicaragua? The United States, because Evo, Evo Morales, um, the president of Bolivia, put a tweet uh, saying that the movement and the insurrection and the people who were demonstrating were all being used by El Imperio, the empire, and that they will, this was all being, um, uh, that it was the oligarchy that was behind. And I wrote back to Evo Morales, who I don't know, but I'm sure he knows me. Um, uh, and, and I say, um, dear Mr. President, uh, allow me to contradict you. The empire is not behind the students. Um, in fact, the students have no weapons. The people in Nicaragua have no weapon to fight uh, Daniel Ortega. And in addition to that, the oligarchy is in bed with Daniel Ortega. And that is one thing that is really important for all of you to understand, is that Daniel Ortega made a deal, he made pacts with the riches, with the oligarchies, and allowed them, gave them uh, tax exempt exceptions to all of them, which is the reason why there was, uh, the economy seemed to be working, and why everything seemed to be calm, because he was not going after the rich and the wealthy uh, and the private sector, like he did before. He learned that lesson. So what will happen? It's very uncertain what can happen. Can the students really, um, can they bring Daniel Ortega down without any weapons? And if they bring them down, will we be able to have free elections? And how can we have free elections? And who will be in, 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 power, in power to have this transition government? All of these are big questions, very difficult. Unfortunately, the Catholic Church and this great bishop cannot be in charge of the country. I, 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 just, just to follow on from that, um, <coughs> would you be opposed to um, intervention from outside the country to, to try and resolve the issue? Or do you want any solution to come from within the country itself? I am always against any foreign interventions any place. We saw what happened in Nicaragua. We saw what happened with the Contra. We had a revolution. We had then the Contra war and we had 50,000 people who died in Nicaragua. We had a revolution. I was, you know, when I was young, girl, I believed in revolutions. I believe on changes that could be brought. I did believe in the Sandinista revolution. I thought it was the it was the hope for all of us in Nicaragua to achieve democracy, to achieve um, freedom of expression and justice. And, uh, and, and what happened? The leader of the, one of the leaders of the revolution be became as bad and as corrupt and as bloodthirsty as the Somoza regime. So no, I am against foreign intervention. I hope that the European Union will speak up and that it will have some influence. Uh, I don't want in any way to have any contact with the US. Uh, I, of course, the, 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 the minute one will have any contact or will call upon them to support it, then we will have uh, the same accusation that Evo Morales was making, that this is all um, inspired by the United States. It is not true. It is not inspired by the United States. Donald Trump couldn't care less about Nicaragua. Maybe he will find a reason to find Nicaragua interesting, but as of now, there is, and there is a few members of parliaments and, and, and a few members, uh, one or two members of the Senate, but that's it. That's what you have today. 
can go to the member in the shirt in the aisle. I said thank you very much for coming to speak to us about an issue which has been really neglected by our media. Um, my question is about how different sections of society are perceiving the protests. So obviously the students... Can you come up a little yeah. bit forward? I cannot hear you. Um, so obviously the protests are... Well, the students are at the forefront of the protests. But how are different sections of society viewing it? So for example, like the middle classes or different generations who are older. So your question really is... How are different members and sections of society viewing the protests? Well, at first it was just a student, but little by little you had the rest of the people in Nicaragua who have joined them and who are supporting them. And you have the, the, the because the most important thing is for them, the people who consider themselves to be Orteguista, or who may consider themselves to be um, Sandinistas, to join on with them and move away from Daniel Ortega. What he's done is exactly what Somoza did, is that he used to use uh, all the workers, all the government's worker, to support and to go on the demonstration. But so it's how will the students manage to get them to support them as well. But then the big question is, and when they do, what can they do to get rid of Daniel Ortega without having a blood shed or having a bloody revolution. But they don't have weapons. Thank you. Um, a lot of the communications you talked about were uh, through uh, social media. How do you, in the age of uh, fake news, kind of discern between more credible and less credible uh, narratives that are coming from, originating from social media? Well, one of the great difficulties about being on Twitter and taking on issues that are controversial and difficult is how do you know who you can retreat and how do you know what you can say? Well, let me tell you something. It is not just simply by reading a tweet, which means I spend a great deal, I spend maybe more time than I should. I have very little sleep in general, not just now with Nicaragua, is that you need to go and look at what that person has said before. You can't just follow that one tweet, but to try to understand who are they? What was their trail of tweets? What did they say before? Now, it is difficult about Nicaragua. I tell you the most difficult issue is about talking about Palestine. And that is you always walking on egg shells. You have to be careful of the person that you are retweeting. It's someone that is not anti-Semitic or being called anti-Semitic. You have to be careful that it's someone who really cares about human rights issues. And what do I do, for example? I tell you how I deal with Israel and Palestine. It is that I go to the human rights organization in Israel, like Bethlehem, if you are interested about what is happening in Israel and what is happening with the Palestinian, read Bethlehem. It's an extraordinary, courageous human rights organization who dare say what needs to be said. There is an organization of um, something like keeping the silent, is, is an organization of soldiers who are denouncing and who are speaking out about what they've been ordered to do and who are being persecuted, who are Israelis. To read, I read the Israeli newspaper, who is one of the most credible, which is called Haaretz. And so I try to uh, find ways in which I will not be accused of being, in, of being uh, partial, will not be accused of being, of being for um, uh, for acts of violence. Uh, so I try to do the same. So it takes a lot of reading, a lot of learning, a lot of following uh, the people that put tweets. And then don't go blind because you can lose your credibility right away. And, uh, and I did that. I made one mistake that I did it because I put a tweet at three in the morning and I learned my lesson. So that's the way I try to go about uh, m my work on social media. 
And of course, I follow all the more credible organizations and work closely with them. Organizations, human rights organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and, um, you know, like I said, Betzelen. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that we should write letters to the students in support of the... It would be great if there could be a letter coming out from the, from the students at Oxford University you know, expressing your support and solidarity and, and, the, uh, and expressing you, your condemnation of the massacres of the students. It will mean a lot to them and I'm sure that it will be something very important for them uh, in this moment of being totally isolated. Thank you. I just wanted to ask in about the canal issue yeah. is at least this environmental disaster being addressed by the international communities or environmental organizations well, attentive to it or is that also it is not being being covered? addressed to a degree mm -hmm. i went last year when i went to march with the with the poor farmers i went to nicaragua to release a report with amnesty international that was called rights for sale that was covered in Nicaragua. It was covered a little bit outside. It was covered in The Guardian. But of course, what I was saying to you about how uh, the prejudices against women, even by the media, even by The Guardian, uh, they wrote a good article. But of course, they couldn't say Bianca Jaga, human rights defender, uh, president and founder of the Bianca Jaga. But they have to say Bianca Jaga, ex-wife of Mick Jaga, turn activist. It just shows you, and I had an issue with the, with, the, um, with the Oxford Union about something that was put out first, that was written about being a human rights activist. A human rights activist is a term used by the media to belittle us, human rights defender. It is a term used by the media and by others to belittle women. Because if I was a man and I had been the founder, the president and the chief executive of a, of a human rights foundation, which I am, if I had been a human rights defender for nearly 40 years, you wouldn't, if I was a man, you wouldn't call me a human rights activist. You will call me Mr. Smith, founder, president and chief executive of a foundation. I think that that may be my last word. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for coming. I do hope that you will continue. Please follow me on Twitter. Please help the students in Nicaragua. It's been great to be with you. Thank you.